Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. I'm Madam O'Cronin. And today we're discussing the future of sleep. So we'll explore why we sleep, what happens when we don't get enough sleep, how to solve the current epidemic of sleeplessness in the modern world, and how our understanding of sleep, health, longevity, and dreams is likely to evolve in the future. But maybe to start, Madam or you can dispel some of the common myths around why we sleep and how much sleep we really need. Definitely. I would say the biggest myth or the most widely believed myth is the idea that some people can get by on just four, five, six hours of sleep per night. And there seems to be a certain type of sleep machismo that is especially prevalent in America. I'm sure you and some of our listeners have heard people who have this tough guy attitude towards sleep where it's like, oh, I've, I'm working 20 hour days. I only sleep for four to five hours a night. You know, you can sleep when you're dead, like that kind of attitude, which is very mm-hmm. like American and very capitalist. <laughs> but the reality is through testing done by Matthew Walker and others in their research labs, if you round to the nearest percent, zero percent of the population is able to function properly on five to six hours uh, Mm -hmm. of sleep per night. So you have a higher likelihood of being struck by lightning than being the type of person who can (laughs) operate well on less than seven hours of sleep per night. So that's like the biggest myth. And there are people in my life who I wanna have this conversation with them and be like, dude, you're only fooling yourself. Like, (laughs) Like you can't operate this way. You gotta get more shut eye. And even with like the extra hours in the day of, you know, doing extra work or whatever, you lose out on the productivity per hour and you also lose out on your creativity. And when you don't have enough sleep, it's like you're not able to see the big picture. You get too caught up in the weeds and you don't see how all the parts connect. So I would say that's the first myth. The other two myths are specifically about aging and and your st- your stage in life so for teens people tend to say okay teens they're just lazy they sleep in too late you know why don't you get out of bed and do something you just you stay up late you're, you're waking up late what the heck is going on and there's actually an evolutionary reason for that which is that teenagers have their biological clock their circadian rhythm gets delayed relative to adults when they hit their teenage years so that they can start to break off from dependency and they can Mm -hmm. learn how to live on their own. So everyone who's a teenager is compelled biologically to go to sleep a little later and to wake up a little later so that you can go do your own teenage things with your tribe of your generation and learn how to be become an adult. So Mm -hmm. don't make your kid wake up and do chores that you know, 8 a.m. on a Saturday, which is something that like a lot of my extended family, like aunts and uncles, that's how they raise their kids. And it's it's you're Mm -hmm. damaging their development when you do that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's also worth pointing out that society as a whole is structuring kids lives to wake up earlier. So we see my my high school started at 715 a.m., which is yeah, I mean, it was ridiculously early early and just having that throughout the week, it creates this sleep pressure. And this is something that uh, Matthew Walker talks a lot about. And when you build this insane sleep pressure up over the course of the week, on the weekend, they're going, you know, kids are going to be sleeping till past noon, which is even mm-hmm. longer than they would have naturally. Um, so it's like, it's this compounding effect that society has been very slow to catch up on. I know there right. are some schools that are, you know, starting with a, a delayed schedule now, like maybe 9 a.m., which is still arguably right. too early. And and I'm not saying that every school can practically do this because there somehow needs to be a match between when parents go to work and when kids go to school. So it's like a huge Or you problem. just have them take a self-driving Tesla there. There we go. Yeah, I mean, that would be the ideal. I guess it's like, well, buses, you know, buses can take kids to school, but 
what happens if the kid is too young or like if if the kid maybe is a little misbehaved like you at least need to make sure that they're going to school like right so that's why we need more flexibility for kids in school but also for parents who work so you can accommodate Mm -hmm. those needs and then i would say on the flip side from how we perceive sleep for young people with older people there's this myth that as you get older you need less and less sleep and the reality is actually that everyone needs eight hours of sleep per night or between seven and nine hours of sleep per night even when you're Mm -hmm. older and what Mm -hmm. happens is you have less of a sleep drive as you get older just because it's just part of what degrades as you get older but that doesn't mean you your body doesn't actually need it so what often happens is that because you tend to get a little bit sleepier you know maybe later in the day that you know the cliche is that older people like fall asleep in front of the tv watching evening news with their (laughs) dinner on their lap and then they have trouble falling asleep when it's actually time to go to sleep and then they'll you know they'll wake up extra early because they didn't sleep Mm -hmm. well and then the, the cycle repeats where then they nap again when watching tv for dinner So the best thing you can do if you're an older person is really fight that so that you only go to sleep at the same time each night and try to get a little bit of sunlight later in the day so that you're, you know, building up more of that sleep pressure that you were referring to. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about getting sunlight is getting it early in the morning, like right when you wake up to lock in your circadian rhythm. Right. Because that signals to your body, like, okay, it's time to be up now. Whereas if you just kind of lay in bed for an hour or two, just kind of looking at your phone or whatever, your body doesn't really know that it's time to be up. It's just like you're awake, but you're you're really forcing yourself to be awake without actually your um, body realizing that it needs to, you know, lock in the circadian rhythm. So yeah. it's it's a little... There's a lot of nuances to it and it's, you know, a good rule of thumb is to just try to see light throughout the day as soon as you can and lock in your circadian rhythm to be as close to the natural rhythms as possible. Right. And it's important that you said sunlight because all types of light, like for instance, I wake up every day at 5.40 a.m. and then I go to, you know, yoga or workout or something and then I'll go to work. But that's before the sun has risen. And I noticed that it was really bothering me that I would see all these bright car lights and street lights and everything Mm -hmm. when you're driving. It was really bothering my eyes. So I started just wearing my blue blocker glasses Mm -hmm. when I was driving in the morning, even though people probably think I'm like a serial killer because it's like 5 a.m. and I'm wearing (laughs) blue blocker sunglasses. But it, it made me feel a lot better in the morning. And I had a more naturalistic cycle where I would, I would, you know, have a slow rise. But then by the time the sun was up, I would really feel awake. And it seems like that is backed up by study. Like you want to rise with the sun and fall asleep several hours after the sun has set. Uh, but you don't want to expose yourself to extra blue light before the sun has risen or after the sun has set, because that can also mess up your circadian rhythm. And, and maybe, Justin, you can say a little bit about what the circadian rhythm is and um, mm-hmm. you know wh- wh- how to define that for listeners. Yeah, so everyone has a circadian rhythm, which is our body's you know, timing of hormones throughout the 24-hour cycle. So in the morning is when the hormone cortisol or, you know, sometimes known as adrenaline, it it kind of spikes up in the morning, which is your alertness hormone. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the day, cortisol sort of drops off. And then you have um, adenosine, which is, there's a lot of, you know, I'm not. Yeah. So I think the simplest way to, to say it is you have your wake drive and your sleep drive. Yeah. And basically the, the wake drive, you can just imagine it as like, this cycle uh, that oscillates, you know, when you wake up, it's at its highest, maybe around like 11 a.m. or noon, and then it's at its lowest, maybe at like, you know, midnight or 2 a.m. But then you also have your sleep drive, which is the melatonin that 
you know, basically triggers your your desire to sleep right around bedtime, like, you know, a few hours after the sun is set. And so if you, for instance, deprive yourself of sleep, like if you're you're jet lagged or whatever, and you just you stay awake or you're cramming for a test, people will listeners will probably recognize that you're really tired at first, but then you sort of get a second wind and you're no longer tired. And the reason for that is that you've experienced your sleep drive, but if you keep staying awake, you then get that wake drive for the next day. But if you imagine this as a chart, the gap between your sleep drive and your wake drive widens and widens the longer you stay awake until you're pretty much, it's unbearable. You can no longer stay awake even though you're still cycling through your wake drive each day that you stay up. And after a certain number of days, sleeplessness will kill you. And that's, that's perhaps another thing I, I didn't realize before researching this. Yeah, I heard um, Matthew Walker and Peter Atia talking about this on Peter's podcast and talking about how we can go without food for, depending on how much fat you have, up to a year or for a regular um, healthy weight person, maybe up to 30 days. You can mm-hmm. go without water for a reasonable amount of time. Like a week. Um, yeah. yeah. Sleep is not, you know, you're, even just one night of no sleep causes a lot of really negative consequences in the body. Mm-hmm. And some, I mean, I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about how sleep is important and why, you know, that we need more sleep than we do. Maybe we talk a little bit about why that's the case like why right why why did sleep evolve in the first place because it seems like such an evolutionary disadvantage why would why would something where we are completely vulnerable we're not reproducing we're not feeding none none of the things that would be considered classical evolutionarily advantageous traits are happening when we're sleeping so why did it evolve why are we asleep one third of our lives and you know, we can, I think we should maybe talk about that. Definitely. But the first, the first thing um, that I find really interesting, the way that Matthew Walker puts it is when we're awake, that's just low level brain damage. Like he, he kind of has this theory and he hasn't tested it yet, but he has this theory that um, sleep, sleep, <laughs> sleep um, is actually the baseline of consciousness it's the baseline for animals and awakeness is actually what happened like that trait was evolved Mm -hmm. so basically when we're awake it's causing all this low level brain damage and build up and sleep is a way for us to refresh that so like when we're in deep sleep our brains actually get flushed with cerebral um, spinal fluid and yeah, it's, the other quote he says is, is that it's yeah. our body's best shot at immortality is sleep. Yeah. And it's yeah. worth noting that every biological organism on the planet that we know of experiences sleep. So mm-hmm. he also has a hypothesis that we evolved initially with basically being asleep all the time. And then wakefulness came later. And mm-hmm. even plants, for instance, sleep trees and plants they will often close their flowers at night and they'll go into a mode of just basically processing the nutrients that they've gathered in the previous day and then the next day will come and then they sort of open up their flowers open up their leaves and then they go to work where just like how we're going around hunting doing work earning a living so we can get our you know the resources we need to keep going that's also what plants are doing And it's the same for every species we know of. However, interestingly, only mammals and birds experience REM sleep. And maybe we can say a little bit about the differences between, you know, non-REM and and REM sleep. And so basically, you know, every being experiences non-REM sleep. And this is, this is, if you see someone's brain in an fMRI scanner, you'll notice that Everything is in this cyclical, nice rhythm where there's sort of this, you know, your whole body, your whole mind is in sync. And 
oftentimes it appears that you're replaying what happened during the day. So they've done tests with mice after going through a maze and it's like their mind is cycling through what that experience in the maze was like. So you're basically creating what, what we call muscle memory, which is actually more accurately defined as brain memory. And you're also transferring the files from your short term memory that day into long term memory. And you're also doing things like managing your your emotions, managing your metabolism, managing mm -hmm. your your blood pressure, your stress levels, all of those. And then when you get into REM sleep, that's when your your eyes are rapidly moving. In the brain scanner, you actually have a similar level of activity as you do when you're awake and what's happening there is you're basically creating new neural connections and you're reconfiguring your map of conceptual connections mm -hmm. so that essentially when you wake up you have a new software update a new version yeah. of your mental <clears throat> map of reality and when you mm -hmm. haven't slept well they've shown you have a 40 percent decrease in your ability to remember new facts so it's almost like if you haven't slept well, any new memories are just getting balanced out. It's like you ran out of memory on your computer and you can no longer accept it. And I think like one way to really get across the concept of this mental map that we're constructing is this game called Convergence. Have you ever heard mm -hmm. of this, this no, game? No, I haven't. So this game is basically, here, we'll, we'll play it real quick. So okay. first, just th think of any word any any concept idea word and then on the count of three just say it out loud and i'm going to do the same i'm just going to think of a random word and say it out loud okay okay ready three yep two one podcast tree. okay tree and podcast so now think of another word that is whatever is related between tree and podcast and then we're going to say it on three. And if we both say the same word, then we converge. We win the game. Okay? Three. Are you ready? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, sure, let's, let's go. All right. Three, two, one. Knowledge. The future of trees. <laughs> okay, so we didn't converge. And we don't have to keep playing this. But you can imagine, basically what we're doing is I'm comparing my mental map of reality to your mental map of reality. And if we converge on the same connecting concept, then that's how you win the game. And it's really fun. I would recommend playing this with like, you know, you can play it with a big group of people where anyone who feels like they know what you're going to say can like raise their hand and then they say the next one. Okay. But I, I just find it fascinating to think of sleep and, you know, dreaming as this process where you're sort of reconfiguring your whole mental map. And that's what, like, there is a limit to how much raw data you can remember. And that's why, you know, sleep also involves forgetting a lot of that. But throughout your life, if you're living life well and you know, sleeping well and gaining knowledge and, and being healthy, you should have a better and better mental map of reality, you know, mm -hmm. the longer you, you live, so long as you remain healthy. Yeah. And what does that lead to? It leads to better decisions. Mm -hmm. It leads to more um, rich connections between people. Like if you're, if you have a more um, interesting point of view or a more creative point of view because one of the things that I think creativity is is it's really just an integration of ideas right so it's like taking seemingly disparate things and putting them together as one mm -hmm. and when you have this this process of REM or well before REM you were saying how all the memories just put straight into long-term storage that's fine but it's kind of like they're in silos at that point and then REM mm -hmm. sleep acts as a way to like integrate all of those silos together. Um, and right, it's like you're, sort of you're putting it in context of your whole narrative self, your sense mm -hmm. of identity, your version of reality. And that's why oftentimes with dreams, people will feel like there's some real significance in what they mm -hmm. have dreamt. And oftentimes there is significance, but it's mm -hmm. not so much that you're getting 
messages from God, and it's more mm -hmm. that you're getting messages from your mysterious subconscious, where oftentimes it's an emotional story. Like you'll have very, it's emotional and visual oftentimes is what's unique yeah. about REM sleep, where you'll have these crazy dreams where you're, you know, you're running, you're seeing things, and then you're having some strong emotional reaction. Maybe there's people who are sort of characters that are similar to people in your life that you've had a strong emotional relationship with, whether it's positive or negative. And just as an interesting side note, Matthew Walker talks about how oftentimes people who say they were abducted by UFOs, act, you know, it pretty much mm -hmm. exclusively occurs at night while they're okay. were sleeping and yeah. they experience a feeling of paralysis like they were oh, a yeah. paralyzing agent that the UFOs yeah. gave them and then there's this really trippy sort of experience where they see figures and beings and it's emotional and there's lights and there's visuals and what is likely happening is not that they were actually abducted by a UFO it's that they were in this state of REM sleep and then they experience sleep paralysis which is terrifying in its mm -hmm. own right because you want to move you want to you know move your head or shout or move your arm or something but you mm -hmm. can't so it's terrifying yeah. to you and then you're in this state between sleepfulness and wakefulness where you're probably still cycling through these visuals mm -hmm. these dreams rapidly and mm -hmm. you have that emotional aspect of dreams where you're processing emotions and strong connections. And if you're the type of person who watches crazy sci-fi movies or whatever, uh -huh. you know, then you have all the ingredients you would need for a UFO abduction experience. And as someone who's experienced sleep paralysis myself, I found it reassuring that they are as common as the hiccups. So it's, it's really? not, yeah. It's not that you have something wrong with you necessarily if you get sleep paralysis. It's actually a fairly normal occurrence. If you get it really often and really badly, it can be a sign, an indicator of narcolepsy. Okay. But for, for most people, it's, it's harmless and you should just try to not freak out too much if it happens <laughs> to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've actually never experienced sleep paralysis and dreams in general are completely fascinating to me mm -hmm. and you know that's what that's what we do in REM sleep is that's when dreams occur and I'm curious if you've ever um, experienced like lucid dreaming or tried to experience lucid dreaming yeah I have it's not something that always happens but I have mm -hmm. specific memories of it like for instance I used to have this recurring nightmare when I was a kid and mm -hmm. the way I broke out of it finally was through lucid dreaming. And so mm -hmm. I had this dream. My dad had re read me this book about like spiders that really freaked me out. And so I had this dream like <laughs> every single night when I was like seven where it was always started the same where I'd be on a school bus. There was this like Asian girl sitting next to me and I was like, oh, what's what's going on at the front? And there was some experiment the teacher was doing where they had this like spider in a jar and then they poured this this substance on the spider and then the mm -hmm. girl would just not say anything to me and then huh. the spider would grow to be bigger than the bus and the bus would like burst open and then I would be like running around in like the holes like where the spider normally lives and the spider would be chasing after me mm -hmm. and I kept having this dream and I was terrified to go to sleep because I knew I would experience it but then finally, one time, for whatever reason, I was able to lucid dream. And I remember saying to the girl next to me, like, I know what's going to happen. I've been in this dream before. Like, this spider is going to uh. get super big. And the spider did get big. And then I just, like, stood my ground and let the spider devour me. And then I never had the dream again. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. I So I've had a similar experience with a nightmare where... In my childhood home there was like my basement and there was a room upstairs that were absolutely terrifying to me mm -hmm. and there were like i never actually saw anything it was almost like i had a terrifying 
um, response to some presence, like some supernatural presence that was in these rooms. And um, same sort of thing. Like it, uh, eventually, after this happened enough times, I just stood and faced this thing. Like it, mm -hmm. I felt it coming towards me, and I turned around, and I was like, just like stood my ground, like you said, and then it yeah. like, never happened again. It's really interesting how that might be a way to overcome some internal trauma as Definitely. well. Definitely. Yeah, and there's that's probably why DMT is such an effective treatment for mm -hmm. people with PTSD or even mm -hmm. psilocybin mushrooms because mm -hmm. these substances put you in a similar state of mind as you are when you're in deep sleep. And it mm -hmm. allows you to process your emotions. And there are some interesting studies being done where you know, for instance, not only are they able to, are researchers able to see what type of dream you're having, like if it's a very visual one or if it's a very, um, in, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of action, a lot of movement by seeing where in your brain activity is lighting up. Mm -hmm. so researchers are also able to now see what the content of the dream is and actually see, are you dreaming about a car? Are you dreaming about a woman? Are you dreaming about a building? Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to think of in the future, will we be able to actually see what someone is dreaming? Like in the farthest version of this, maybe you can literally record your dreams, put on VR goggles and relive your dreams in the same sort of way that you experience them. And then maybe even share them on social media uh -huh. or, or send them to your friends like, dude, you're not going to believe this dream I just had. Check this out. <laughs> and then on the, you know, on the therapeutic side. It, there are also tactics where you can help someone induce a deeper state of sleep. And what they're doing now, you know, Matthew Walker in his lab, they're actually giving low level electrical impulses to your brain that reinforce the natural cycles of your non REM sleep. Mm -hmm. So it makes the oscillations of your brain activity higher and greater so that you achieve that deeper level of sleep. And Eventually, it could get so good that we could use that sort of treatment to remove negative experiences for people with PTSD. And yeah. we might even be able to do it where you can selectively remember certain things. Like if, you're, if you practice that day really hard and your goal in life is to be a great pianist, perhaps mm. one day you can just go into your phone and say... I really want to spend like almost all of my NREM sleep tonight on remembering this piano practice. I really don't care about like the other stuff that happened today nearly as much. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of interesting possibilities with sleep as it relates to the future. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine how trippy it would be to replay your dreams and experience it while you're conscious and, ha you know, your cortex is running? Because yeah. you know, when I think about my dreams, I just kind of like appear all over the place. Like the the landscape changes around me. In my dream, it's totally normal, or it seems normal that everything is changing, and that or that I'm looking at a clock and it's just like melty, or like it like you can't really focus on one thing in particular. It's like right. your gaze is. It, it's a. It would be a very interesting thing. I hope that happens because right. I want to experience just how weird dreams actually are yeah and the, the reason why it's so trippy is that your prefrontal cortex is basically turned off when you're when you're dreaming and you're asleep mm -hmm. so your prefrontal cortex is the ceo of the brain that's like what mm -hmm. makes us the most human that's what largely mm -hmm. separates us from other apes and so when you're asleep it's like that ceo is gone and all of the children are running wild and they're just doing whatever they want to in this safe environment where you're not going to move around or thrash that much if you're a healthy sleeper. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to sort of process all of these emotions and thoughts and memories and ideas and connections in a way that is just totally fluid and it's not beholden to rationality or logic or hierarchical mm -hmm. understandings in the same mm -hmm. way that you are when you're awake, which is also why it's kind of similar to, you know, the psychedelic experience where in mm -hmm. a way it seems more real and more 
honest to the way reality actually is because you're not it not everything mm-hmm. is framed in that logical you know mm-hmm. typical wakeful construction right yeah i bet you know once we understand that like you said we can really sl- like catapult um learning into the future like we can we can make it to where we're learning things that are totally inconceivable at an early age like it could be possible in the far future that a PhD level education is possible by the end of, you know, or by the age of 18 mm-hmm. or something even further, as long as we can kind of integrate these memories more effectively. And there's probably a tons of, a ton of ways we can do that. Um, and, you know, we might also be able to increase the, um, bodily repair mechanisms that go on during sleep. And we might be able to, I mean, Matthew Walker talks a ton about dementia and Alzheimer's as it relates to sleep. And if we can keep learning and make sure that our, that we're sleeping and our brains are active during sleep and actively cleansing themselves during sleep, then it could reduce the risks of these diseases by pretty inconceivable amounts. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we already mentioned that, you know, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher both bragged about sleeping mm-hmm. only a few hours a night. They both developed Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. President Trump also brags about only needing four hours of sleep a night. And he should be mm-hmm. careful because he could likewise develop Alzheimer's. There was also a study done with Japanese businessmen where they looked at, at their health their, specifically their cardiovascular health for male Japanese workers who slept less than seven hours a night and Japanese workers who slept more than seven hours a night, the risk of heart attack and the incidence of heart attacks was 500% greater for the group that only slept less than seven hours a night. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's insanely uh, easy to see the difference in health when you just look at the data and You know, I think it's maybe now we talk a little bit about the societal level epidemic that is sleeplessness, especially in America. And I think the first, you know, the first like sort of stats to realize is that, you know, the average amount of sleep right now in America is not looking so good. It's around six and a half hours per night. And there's also an obesity rate of around 35 percent. Of all Americans are obese. Now, fast or sorry, rewind to 1950, the average amount of sleep was almost nine hours, and the level of obesity was 12 percent. So yeah. this is another interesting correlation where people like to say how yeah Americans were spending more on healthcare than almost than any other country, and yet life expectancy is actually declining. But it's not necessarily that our health care is so awful. It's more that our health is so awful. The way we live our lives is so awful. And it used to be the case that people thought, oh, there's three pillars of health. There's sleep, diet, and exercise. But now the thinking is actually that sleep is the foundation for the other two mm-hmm. pillars, that diet and exercise mm-hmm. sit on top of the foundation that is a good night's sleep. and. Yeah. What happens is if you don't get enough sleep, you're hungrier the next day, you overeat, you're also over caffeinated. It takes about 14 hours for most of the caffeine to leave your body. So if you're someone who has an afternoon cup of coffee or if you're someone who has a nightcap of alcohol, both of those will give you worse sleep. You'll continue to overeat. You'll get obese. You'll become diabetic. All of mm-hmm. the, your health will just unravel. It's, it exacerbates aging. You know, we talked a lot in the future of aging that it damages your telomeres, which is basically like whenever your DNA replicates, there's these like, you know, shoelaces at the end mm-hmm. that sort of keep the DNA information safe. And that mm-hmm. those shoelaces fray when the telomeres get damaged. And that happens at a much faster rate when you haven't had a good night's sleep. Even one night of sleep that you miss is a big deal and that's another really important point for anyone listening to this is that you cannot catch up on sleep there's no banking of your sleep if you miss out on sleep you will never get that sleep back 
Yeah, and it's good to approach that from an evolutionary lens as well. We historically haven't had the issue of sleeplessness. There hasn't had to be some sort of adaptive mechanism to deal with sleeplessness the same way that our bodies have adapted to um, uh, famine, for example. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you mentioned is how it really increases uh, weight gain. And that's actually mm -hmm. a, a multifaceted um, mechanism. So when we lose sleep, our bodies are in a more um, stressed state. And when we're in a more stressed state, we hold on to fat cells more tightly and get rid of the muscle cells. So if you're trying to work out, if you're trying to diet, none of this even matters if you're not sleeping just because of that. And you also tend to make worse decisions. You don't eat as well um, just because of this low energy and stressed state that you're in. So there's so many things that are going on that lead to poor health that you know we need to really solve the foundation like you Definitely. said which is sleep yeah and and for anyone who still after listening to this has that machismo attitude where it's like you know I, i'm i'm fine with five hours of sleep i would point to another piece of data which is that when you get less than seven hours of sleep your sperm count is not is 29 percent lower your testicles mm -hmm. are smaller noticeably smaller mm -hmm. And you have the sex drive of someone 10 years older than you. So yep. you have much less, much lower sexual performance when you aren't getting enough sleep than when you are. So do you still think it's macho to not get a good <laughs> night's sleep? And then if you're, if you're a woman, you, have a, you tend to have fertility issues if you don't get enough sleep. And it also raises your risk of cancer, both prostate cancer and breast cancer, and also bowel cancer, all are increased when you're not getting enough sleep. And then there's another, you know, as far as your immune system, there are these cells called natural killer cells, which are basically like your James Bond assassins that go in and take out all the bad, uh, you the know, cancerous all, cells. Yeah, all the other cancerous cells. And when you, even just a single night of four hours of sleep, you will have 70% fewer killer cells. So let's say you go to the, you get a flu shot after having you know only four hours of sleep, the likelihood of you actually combating the flu is way, is super diminished compared to if you had gotten eight hours. And it's the same if you're exposed to any sort of pathogens um, you're just mm -hmm. way more likely to contra contract a disease if you haven't had a full night's rest yeah yeah maybe um now i think it's pretty clear that we need sleep maybe we talk about how people can improve their sleep sure, sure. one of the things that i think is most important is to track your sleep so i have this um this aura ring which is uh so that's o r um oh sorry o u r a and basically the um matthew so walker peter, wears that too yeah he wears it peter atia is a um, investor in that company and seems to be one of the best sleep trackers outside of going to one of these um sleep labs like the berkeley sleep lab or um something like that and basically this thing will tell you if you like how much REM sleep you get, how much light sleep you get, which is non REM phase one and two, and then also how much uh, deep sleep you get and how mm -hmm. much you're disturbed during the night, wake up, and so on. Well, your heart rate is, your heart rate variability. It's a pretty cool ring. And to be able to get that feedback every day kind of sets the tone for what you should expect and if you see one night of bad sleep you can react immediately so it's it's not necessarily something that you know you're not going to make up that sleep but you can kind of see what did i do the night before that lead to that mm -hmm. led to this poor quality sleep for example i know when i when i have any alcohol really maybe like two drinks you know a, a reasonable amount of alcohol two or three and um i see that rem sleep is decimated like mm -hmm. i don't get rem sleep and and also deep sleep is affected too i'm basically staying in this light sleep 
for most of the night, as well as having a bunch of disturbances. Same thing with THC. Hmm. And the, the only thing that I've seen that helps some sort of substance is CBD. I mean, that just skyrockets my deep sleep. It doesn't have much of an effect on REM sleep. Um, but I can see these things that I'm doing the day before, what it, what happens to my sleep. And getting that constant feedback is a way for me to kind of build an internal model of what's going yeah. on. And there, do, are, there are other devices that... Um, do you wear it wear all day or just at night? All day, every day, yeah. So what about it charging also, um, so it lasts a week oh, and wow. then it charges, wow. yeah, it charges in like an hour. So it's like this cordless charger. You just kind of set it around. Um, that's awesome. And then, yeah. Cause I've been looking into getting a sleep tracker for myself after doing all this research. And I saw that uh-huh. it seems like the big ones are the aura ring. And then there's a company called bed it, which hmm. was actually oh, bought by yeah. Apple. And it's like, is that like the sheet over your bed? Yeah. It's like something you just put on your bed. So you like under the sheet, but like just on Uh top of the mattress that you don't have to wear anything and it integrates really well with Apple Mm -hmm. health. The other company it is, you know, we things, which makes a lot of like Wi-Fi, internet of things and that you Mm -hmm. actually put underneath your mattress. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm curious, like it's interesting to hear you speak about which substances have led to different types of sleep because part of the reason is that that's important is we're so bad at knowing how good of a night's sleep we've gotten and how different substances are really affecting us we're also bad at predicting how well we'll perform on different levels of sleep so by Mm -hmm. seeing the data seeing really is believing and it gives you much greater insight into your circadian rhythms and what's needed um, mm-hmm. It's interesting that you say that you you know haven't gotten great sleep with THC, because for me you know I I used to be on you know I used to have sleeping pills when I was like teenager mm-hmm. or whatever, but then I sort of moved to weed in my twenties and mm-hmm. I've had a much better time sleeping. I, I used to I was diagnosed with insomnia. I no mm-hmm. longer have insomnia. I fall asleep fine. I wake up feeling refreshed, mm-hmm. but I have heard on you know the Joe Rogan podcast with Matthew Walker and elsewhere that you mm-hmm. do have less REM sleep on marijuana and mm-hmm. there's not as much evidence compared to alcohol and caffeine and tobacco we know those are really bad for sleep yeah. there has haven't been as many studies done with marijuana but mm-hmm. I'm curious do you notice that you feel like you've had a better night's sleep when you when you haven't had THC and maybe when you've just had CBD or is it just that you see a difference in your REM sleep in the app so it is an interesting thing to me um and I think it also depends on like the administration so do you smoke it do you have an edible or whatever Mm -hmm. um so either way I notice that falling asleep is extremely easy Mm-hmm. Like it's just it's very cozy you fall asleep. I also notice a sort of um, it, it, It's it's more I actually seem to have more vibrant dreams, which is what makes me feel Like if I wasn't looking at the data, that's what would make me feel like I got more REM sleep But it's it's almost like I have like shorter and more intense REM sleep hmm. um, than than typical and yeah i mean it it also depends on how early in the day so it's like if you if or if i um were to if i you know if i had some a little bit before sleep then it would make me fall asleep easier and whatever if it was earlier in the day it doesn't really affect right well i noticed that Uh, so i have another question for you so i noticed that before i went to japan I was, you know, uh-huh. more or less smoke weed most days, but in mm-hmm. Japan, they're super strict weed laws. So for almost two weeks, I didn't have any THC, any weed, really didn't have much alcohol mm-hmm. either, just because I don't personally like to drink that much. No tobacco, mm-hmm. not that much caffeine either. And I just mm-hmm. got flooded with dreams, with the wildest dreams, 
every night mm. I'd wake up, I'd tell Maria about my crazy dreams. <laughs> and it felt like I had been building up all of this like dream fluid that when I stopped smoking weed, it was just unleashed. The floodgates were <laughs> furled open. And yeah. so I wonder, like, from my research, it doesn't seem like that's something that happens with alcohol or caffeine or tobacco. It's it's mm -hmm. more just like you miss out on it. So I mm -hmm. wonder if if you take regular breaks from you know THC, if your mm -hmm. net REM sleep is the same, you're just sort of flooding it out all at once rather than having a little bit each night. I mean, that would be my hope, yeah. but <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um... It's something that you just probably need to experiment with yourself. I, I've I gotta heard get that an story. Aura ring, I think. Is... Yeah, I've heard that story a lot where if people just kind of give it a little break, the dreams are just kind of outrageous. Um, right. And that's, you know, that, that could be some, or actually one follow-up question for you is, did you feel like you had trouble falling asleep? Like, do you feel like that might have been? Well, um, it's definitely easier for me to fall asleep when I've had a, a little bedtime toke. Mm -hmm. But I would say I've, I feel like philosophically I've overcome sleeplessness because yeah. I'm no longer as stressed about reality because I've sort of realized that the only thing that exists is consciousness and its contents and nothing okay. can really harm me, whether it's physical pain or something with jobs. So I feel like I don't have the same level of anxiety that I did when I was an insomniac in my teenage years. Mm -hmm. so, but it definitely takes longer and normally I'll just read for you know an, 50 pages more than I typically would if I haven't had any you know THC mm -hmm. or CBD yeah so yeah I don't know yeah. I, I, I'm really interested to sort of track my results and I'll, I'll definitely share it with these with our listeners if I find anything interesting yeah yeah I mean we all sort of have our own you know artifacts or our own, own problems with sleeping like my problem is I can fall asleep immediately like my sleep latency which is how fast you fall asleep is somewhere between like six and eight minutes like it's very fast relatively right. speaking um but once i'm done with my deep sleep i will kind of wake up more frequently and i have mm. i do have like crazy dreams almost always um and i i wonder if my dreams wake me up a lot of times and it's not like i don't really have nightmares it's just my dreams are weird Right. right. And that's and um, sometimes when I wake up a lot, it, it affects REM sleep. So typically I'll get like last night I got an hour and a half of REM sleep and two and a half hours of deep sleep. Like I'm all, almost always in the two to two and a half hour range for deep sleep. But REM sleep could be a little higher, I think. Um, right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then I guess for listeners, just giving some advice based on research for how to get a good mm -hmm. night's sleep. Yep. The number one piece of advice Matthew Walker gives is regularity. Always mm -hmm. falling asleep and waking up at the same time. And if you have an iPhone, it's really easy now. There's in your clock app, there's bedtime. And you can set your bedtime. Like I have this where my bedtime is 9.40 p.m. And my mm -hmm. wake-up time is 5.40 p.m. So I get a full eight hours. Mm -hmm. And usually I'm in bed before 9.40 reading so that I can actually try to be asleep by 9.40. Mm -hmm. So I would set that, if, and I, I think there's something similar with Android phones as well. Mm -hmm. The other big thing he says that's important is temperature. We drop our internal temperature when we sleep. If you look at the cycle, we're the hottest in like, you know, early, mid-afternoon, and then our temperature drops pretty low when we're asleep. And so if you can be in an environment that's around 65 degrees, that's mm -hmm. optimal for most people. Mm -hmm. You should also have lower lights as it gets later in the day. So you're sort of in line with that natural rhythm. And, you know, ultimately the mm -hmm. best scenario would be if you could connect your bio tracking data with how you sleep with your thermostat in your home, with your humidifier, with lighting mm -hmm. so then everything sort of works in synchronicity with what's best for your body but short mm -hmm. of that i think everyone can take steps to just you know turn on the air conditioner at night go to s oh, the other big thing he says is that when people first wake up you immediately check your phone 
And that mm-hmm. creates this state of anticipatory anxiety where you're anxious right when you wake up because you're, you're expecting to be flooded with a bunch of information like emails and work messages and all that. So mm-hmm. if you can just hold off until, you know, start with just trying to hold off until after you brush your teeth. And then if you can do that, try to hold off until after you've had breakfast. And the more you, yeah. put, you put it off, the healthier your mind will be when you wake up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's all good stuff. And then obviously, like, really thinking about your light, the environment. So if you can somehow match the internal lighting of your house to be similar to the outside lighting to kind of get your in indoor circadian rhythm uh, to match the outdoor environment, that would be awesome. Because one of the issues we see today is people during the day, they're in a much lower light environment than what is outside because we're inside we have these crappy fluorescent lights everywhere and at night all the lights are on inside so it's way brighter inside than it is outside and all of this is with low quality light it doesn't really have a full spectrum typically more uh, blue light focused lighting and it just messes everything up Mm -hmm. um so that's that's one thing that I've really focused on, like just having blue blocking glasses. I have these like amber glasses that I'll wear um, all the time. Screens, all of that is blue light. Um, mm-hmm. That that is. Although more... most uh, most like Apple devices now at least have that like lux yeah. overlay. I don't know yeah. how effective that is, but it seems better than how it used to be. Yeah, for sure, for sure. There's there's a lot of research about it mm-hmm. and companies have taken action to kind of um, make sure that all of that is um, working. Yeah. Yeah. The other, I'll just name two more things that Matthew Walker said, and then maybe we can get into our future scenarios. So meditation is another good practice Mm -hmm. if you're having trouble sleeping, because it just gives you more control over your mind and your sensations and your thought patterns. The Mm -hmm. other piece of advice he has is that if you are the type of person that has a lot of struggles getting to sleep, you shouldn't stay in bed for more than 20 minutes while struggling to sleep. If you still can't sleep after 20 minutes, get up and go to your couch or your living room and read a book or do something because that way you're training your mind that your bedroom is your place for sleep and only Mm -hmm. sleep. Intimacy is fine, but you shouldn't do mm-hmm. work in your bed. You shouldn't watch TV in your bed. And they mm-hmm. even did a study where they measured the sleep of children in their bedroom with and without having toys. And the children that did not have toys in their bedroom slept significantly better, better quality huh. and better duration of sleep than children that had toys in their room because they're hmm. thinking about play and they sort of want to go play with their toys at night. Whereas if you only think of your bedroom as the place for sleep, that distraction does not exist in the same way. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's so much we can do to like change policy, change company policy, school policy. Um, all of There's so many things that can be changed to improve sleep as a whole in society. And I think yeah. the beginning is just having a better understanding and a better education around sleep and how important it is. Yeah, and the, the quote I'll, I'll leave us with before we get into future scenarios, which I love, is the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. I and like that it. Was, that I, was it, by uh, E.J. Kosman, a marketer who popularized ant farms and shrunken heads and made a lot of money selling. <laughs> Just as a side <laughs> note, I thought that was interesting. The ant farm guys, farm guys is really... <laughs> enlightened dude but anyways let's take a quick break and then get into our future scenarios all right justin what is the worst case scenario for the future of sleep worst case scenario i think the worst case is sort of a continuation of what we're seeing today where there's this there's this culture around lack of sleep that is glorified and people are you know getting less sleep for the mere fact that they they want to seem like they're productive obviously we know that that's counterproductive 
Um, but there's also the lack of sleep um, and problems that come with sleep that are um, policy based. So what what are the school start times? What are the actual company start times? What how do we uh, give kids more of a um, or a better developmental process going forward when it comes to sleep. And I think all of these things can be changed by just setting rules and start times for work and school uh, to be a little bit later. And also having company policies that make it impossible to, or not impossible, but make it makes it much more difficult for workers to not get enough sleep. Um, mm-hmm. I think there was um, there was some progress when residents, so medical residents, um, could work a maximum of 80 hours, whereas previously it was limitless. Like there was, mm-hmm. there, there have been horror stories of uh, residents working like 100, 120 hour weeks. Like basically their entire week was working, sleeping maybe a couple hours a night. When you're operating on patients and you're trying to give medical advice, this is the worst possible mm-hmm. thing that we could be putting in the hand, you know, making our uh, medical students and future doctors go, go through. Um, yeah. And even the current state is pretty awful. You know, my cousin Martin, who's been on the podcast, mm-hmm. Martin Mullen, who's an ophthalmologist, even with the 80 hour a week limit, the reality is that you're working like a 10 or 12 hour a day and then mm-hmm. you're on call at night. So yeah. even if you only you know, have to work an extra three hours that night after going in your normal day, you're totally disrupting your sleep cycle because at 2 a.m. you'll get a call, you'll have to go into the office, you'll be there from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., you come back and get like one or two hours of sleep, it just totally mm-hmm. disrupts your rhythm. So, and it, you know, it's, I don't know what the right solution is because emergencies do happen in the middle of the night and it's known from the World Health Organization that working at night, doing regular night shifts, is a probable carcinogen. So I'm not sure what the right solution is. Maybe it's like mm-hmm. AI doctors at night or something, but it's it's uh-huh. a tricky situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of that is that's that's kind of like the foundation of the worst case, and then the actual worst case is the effects of all of this, which we're again seeing today. Um, where people are getting fatter, people are much more unhealthy, people's learning capabilities are much lower, which means decision makers are making much worse decisions. Mm-hmm. And when you see this propagate into the upper echelons of society, like in the political realm, for example, if we have a president that is not getting enough sleep, what kind of decisions are those? What happens if that person was actually getting enough sleep? And that's probably not just a Trump phenomenon. I'm sure every single president we've had has trouble sleeping because of the ridiculousness of the job mm-hmm. and you know people that are making decisions um, across the board. If they're getting um, much less sleep than they need to, then that leads to worse decisions and that leads to a worse society as a whole. Yeah. Um, so, and and also you know this could lead to worse decisions in the case of warfare. Like if someone's feeling overly um, evil or, or just having really poor decision and um, the... Um, You're more emotionally talk- volatile. So if, if yeah, a yeah, civilian yeah. eggs you on and you've only had two or three hours of sleep, the likelihood of you shooting that civilian is far greater than if you had gotten a full yeah. eight hours and see the whole context of the operation and the civilian's perspective and your perspective. And yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just all bad. And and I think that's my worst case scenario. I'm right. curious what yours is. Yeah, I would I would echo a lot of what you said. It's proven that people make poorer decisions when they are on less sleep. And one experiment of this is daylight savings time. So every fall, we fall back in time, meaning we get an extra hour of sleep that night. And every spring, Mm -hmm. we spring forward in time, meaning we have to get up Mm -hmm. one hour earlier. In the case where we spring forward and sleep for one hour less, there is a 29% increase in car accidents and also heart attacks are greater that day. 
judges. It's like twenty five percent yeah. increase in heart attacks, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and judges make more stringent decisions. Like they'll give you a worse sentence if your court date is the morning after daylight savings time, <laughs> rather than a typical day. So this like just the case of one single day and one single hour makes that big of a difference you can see how that can propagate society wide to cause some serious issues i would also echo the points you made about sort of work theater and this culture we have where you know there was recently that article about the the culture at away the tech company that makes the suitcases and it was this same sort of thing where for you to be considered a dedicated employee you had to be on Slack until the wee hours of the morning and you had to be in the office late in the day. You know, I have friends who work in banking and a lot of the time it's like they don't even have work they need to do, but they just stay in the office until late at night and then wake up super early because that's how they signal to their superiors that they're really dedicated. But Mm -hmm. even Wall Street has gotten more lax on their schedule after... A, a trader was on a sleepless binge and then he mm-hmm. basically crossed the street and got hit by a bus and was killed because he was just in the state of delirium where he wasn't paying attention he didn't have the right response time and mm-hmm. he was killed and people might be surprised to hear that there are more deaths as a result of drowsy driving than there are of all types of driving under the influence, you know, including alcohol and all types of drugs. So there's like serious problems with operating on a lack of sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say like, if our current trends continue, we're also going to see greater health problems as Americans become, you know, they sleep even less, they become even more obese, they develop dementia, Alzheimer's, heart issues, diabetes, all of the hypertension, all of these issues are going to are going to increase so long as we continue this current trend of of having less and less sleep. And mm-hmm. you know, like you said, it, it exacerbates our problems in the prison system where mm-hmm. prisoners have to wake up and go to like wake up and go to sleep at, you know, schedules that don't necessarily give you a luxurious eight to nine hours of sleep. So you see greater levels of aggression and uh, repeat offenders in prison. You also see, you know, feelings of racism and, you know, police violence get exacerbated, military Mm -hmm. violence, aggression. It's really just we have more primal ways of thinking when we haven't gotten enough sleep than when we have. So yeah, I agree. My worst case scenario is that we continue along the trend that we're on. And if mm-hmm. we do that, then it's not looking good for the future of modern society. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the best case then? Best case scenario. My best case is pretty optimistic. And in general, I'm pretty optimistic about the future. Mm-hmm. I believe that there is going to be a convergence of tracking the measured self Mm -hmm. and autonomous internet connected devices. So I do feel like in the near future, there's going to be a situation where most people have an aura ring or an Apple watch or something they stick under their bed or a smart mattress that's going to track their sleep in a very accurate way. And that data is going to be connected to their home lighting system, their temperature, their humidity, Mm -hmm. and maybe even beyond that, maybe even their car has, you know, the windshields dim to a certain level, depending on the day, maybe the Mm -hmm. office dims to a certain uh, setting in the day. And all of that will increase our health, our longevity, our mental well-being, our emotional stability, our productivity, our creativity, our performance, everything will be better when we live in that sort of a world. And I also hope that we sort of do away with this work theater mentality where people signal how hard they're working or how valuable they are based on how little they're sleeping. And I, I already see some positive trends in that 
direction with things like remote work. Mm -hmm. Remote work is becoming more normal. I, I think I retweeted on our Twitter feed this quote that said that in the future, your company office is going to be kind of like the equivalent of a showroom where it's mm. good thing for early employees or people who want to, you know, take some pics and, you know, schmooze. But for most workers, you just work wherever is best suited for your particular preferences, whether that's working from home or working from a co-working office near your home or coming into the office once or twice a week. That does seem to be the future of work. And mm -hmm. I will I hope that that'll allow for greater flexibility so people can really get a good night's rest and having rules around, you know, mm -hmm. we don't expect you to be on Slack after 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's also a bias between, you know, early birds and night owls. And early birds tend to rise higher in the ranks. They get promoted more often. They're perceived as being more valuable. I'm an early bird, so I even have these these biases a little bit myself but some people just simply are night owls that's the way mm -hmm. their body functions and there's an evolutionary reason for that the reason is that when you're asleep you're the most vulnerable so if everyone in your tribe falls asleep at the same time there's there would be eight hours when your tribe is vulnerable but when some people are night owls and some people are early birds you limit that to only four hours of collective vulnerability so it's not yeah. someone's fault that they naturally, it takes them a, lot, a little bit longer to get going in the morning, but then they're able to perform for a little bit later in the day. I think we yeah. need to really understand w the differences between what makes people most productive and what people prefer and what makes people the healthiest. And in mm -hmm. general, it's a transition from focusing on treatment and sick care into focusing on health care which is yeah. not just treatment but also prevention and that's yeah. the big shift that i really hope will occur in the best case scenario yeah i'm with you on pretty much all of that um i think in my best case the pretty much we take a a very uh, multifaceted approach to solve this issue i think um, when it comes to urban design and when it comes to interior design, we kind of design spaces that optimize for sleeping. And if you really think about it, you're in your bed way more often than you are in the other parts of your house. Like that's the most common place. So we should really focus on that. But we should also set up the other parts of homes and apartments to kind of lead to bed when it's necessary. So. Um, I also think in office spaces, we really need to get the natural light thing figured out. Like when I walk into an office that has fluorescent lights and like, almost like a school building, I mean, same thing. Kids are under the, these like fluorescent lights. Some schools have almost no natural light um, because they have these tiny little windows. Then what happens is kids are getting worse sleep. Their circadians are either, even further messed up. Um, and mm -hmm. learning is, you know, again, I'm sort of talking about yeah. worst case here, but in the best case, we kind of, we fix all of those issues. And I think that if we understand this and we get kids to school later, um, and they're able to learn better, I think honestly, if we're talking about how this affects learning in kids, that could honestly propagate to everything mm -hmm. in the future. Right, because if we really take care of kids, take care of their learning, take care of their mental development, that's a recipe for success in the future. Yeah. And if they're learning more effectively, then we can improve education across the board just by letting kids have better sleep. And, Definitely. And I think when we do that, then you know we have better science education. We have better, really, just better. Um, reason and logic across the board but we also have better creativity it's like this perfect storm of of awesome you know intellectual capabilities as long as we can let kids get the sleep that they need and also let adults get the sleep that they need like all all people in society can be productive but like we've talked about a couple times sleep is just the foundation
Totally. So all of all of the best cases that we've ever talked about on Hence the Future rests on the innovators. And the innovators themselves need sleep. And we can have more innovators if we let kids and people have more sleep. And and it's just this this foundational thing that is often overlooked. And that's the other part of the best case, is it's not overlooked. Like people really start to see what the true benefit of sleep is. And right. um, yeah, all of, pretty much all of that is my best case. There's also this misconception with education that you need prerequisites to learn the current state of reality. Mm-hmm. And scientists have continuously been surprised at how much people can absorb just through mm-hmm. their natural process of learning in the day, getting a good mm-hmm. night's sleep, and then absorbing that information. For instance, it used to be counterintuitive to think of the world as round. It, like For mm-hmm. people who grew up thinking the world was flat, it was hard to wrap your head around the idea that the world is round. Now, mm-hmm. now it's similar to thinking about the world, thinking about the concept of relativity, for instance, or thinking about mm. quantum mechanics. It's really hard if you grew up in a system where that wasn't drilled into you early on, and then later you mm-hmm. have to sort of wrap your head around it. Mm-hmm. I think there's a real opportunity where we don't have to do all these prerequisites. We can give pe- give kids the current version of reality as we understand it today through exercises through visualizations through having them Mm -hmm. experience what it's like to view the world in this way and then if we give them enough sleep they will be able to update their mental software to the latest Mm -hmm. version and that's how we're going to push forward and solve the great problems of our day is there life on other is there life on other planets uh, is there mm-hmm. a unified theory of everything that we just haven't discovered yet? How do we mm-hmm. square what's going on in the quantum realm to what's going on in the macro realm? We're not mm-hmm. going to solve it by having kids go through the same old, outdated thought processes that got mm-hmm. us to our current stage. We need a mm-hmm. new way of thinking about education where we update mm-hmm. people's software to the current version first and then let them mm-hmm. process it through sleep diet, exercise, and a little bit of flexibility mm-hmm. for people's personal predilections. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's exactly what we need. Now, maybe in the likely case, let's, let's see how likely that is. Yeah. <laughs> Most likely scenario. I must say, I believe that there is nowhere to go from up. Or there's nowhere to go mm-hmm. but up from here. Yeah. If you yeah. look at the fact that kids are sleeping for two hours less per night on average than they were 100 years ago, and Americans in general are sleeping for about you know almost two to three hours less than they were we were 100 years ago, mm-hmm. all we have to do to see some serious improvements is to just get back to where we were, you know, 50, mm-hmm. 75, 100 years ago. It's not like we're we're, uh, you know, blazing this new trail of sleeping for longer than is natural. We literally just need to go back to a more natural cycle Mm -hmm. of, Mm -hmm. you know, sleeping for eight hours a day. And I think that's totally doable. And I also believe the more knowledge that we get through wearables and sleep Mm -hmm. trackers and the more Mm -hmm. knowledge we get through research, and there's a lot of research being done in this space, the more mm-hmm. we as individuals, as organizations, as governments, as all of society, will be able to understand the importance of sleep and we can adjust our, our practices mm-hmm. accordingly. I do think daylight savings time will be abolished and that'll be great. Mm-hmm. And I do think the trend of remote work and flexibility around how people learn and how people perform in the office is going to evolve in a positive direction. So my most likely scenario is maybe not as far as my best case scenario, but it's pretty close in that best case direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. I think in my likely case, we really are in the direction of the best case. 
Um, there are still trends, but it, it's it's not really trending worse. It's just kind of remaining the same at this point in some realms, but also as a whole, I think it's getting better because the education around this is getting better. And I think Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, came out at a perfect time. And it's getting yeah. all the necessary attention um, that it, you know, that would lead to society kind of adopting new practices. But I think that there's so much natural resistance to the worst cases that we've talked about that our, our predilection is to just get eight hours, right? Like we're resisting the best case because the best case is the natural case. Right. So everything we do is just resisting that and resistance can only happen for so long. Um, and then it's going to have to give to, you know, to some extent, either, either some technology is going to render sleep obsolete, which right. I don't see happening ever. It's um, kind of like an okay cyborgs. boomer phenomenon where that's the mentality of the older generations. And when it's mostly millennials and Gen Z's that are the bosses in the workforce, mm -hmm. I can't imagine we would have the same attitudes towards like, come on, you can sleep when you're dead. Like, oh, you're not work. <laughs> You're not able to have a you know Zoom call at 10 p.m. at night. Like, what are you not dedicated? Like, I think that mentality is going to evaporate as the new generations are ushered into, you know, the higher positions in the workforce. Right. Yeah. And and I really think that we are going to approach the best case, and I'm excited about it. Yeah. So I would say, just as a final note for listeners, if you are interested in this space and you want to learn more, I would definitely recommend Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams. A lot of the research we referenced in this episode is talked about in his book. He's also been on Joe Rogan. So he also has a TED Talk. So if you want to learn more, I would, I would recommend checking out his work. And I would also wish you the best night's sleep. So thank you everyone for listening. This has been the Future of Sleep. And we hope to see you next time. The past, the present, and the future. Hey Futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.